In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. The greatest of all of the mysteries of our holy faith is the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity, which we celebrate today. And indeed, it is the most impenetrable to our created intellects. Nevertheless, God did not expect us to worship an unknown God, as St. Paul found the Athenians worshiping when he preached the gospel in that city. Our blessed Lord has told us many things about his Father and about the Holy Ghost. And the Catholic Church, having preserved these sacred words of Christ, has given to us a set of dogmas in her magisterium concerning the Blessed Trinity. In St. Matthew we read, And Jesus, being baptized forthwith, came out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and coming upon him. And behold, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Therefore, the three persons are clearly indicated in this one paragraph, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In St. Luke we read, when the angel Gabriel appeared to our Blessed Lady, he said to her, He, meaning our Lord, shall be great and shall be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of David his father, and he shall reign in the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How shall this be done, because I know not man? And the angel answering said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. And therefore also the Holy, which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. And there again, in that one dialogue, you have the three persons mentioned, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. In St. John's first epistle we read, And there are three who give testimony in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. The declarations of the Church are equally clear. The Fourth Lateran Council solemnly declared, We firmly believe and acknowledge that there is but one true God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, three persons, but one substance and one nature. Notice that it says one true God, not just one God, but one true God, that is, as opposed, to, as opposed to one false God. That means that if you do not believe in Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, you do not worship the true God, the one true God. And so much for all of the ecumenical talk about all worshiping the same God. We do not. We do not worship the same God as the Jews or as the Muslims, for they do not recognize Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The preface of the Holy Trinity says that in the confession of a true and eternal deity, distinctness in the persons, unity in the essence, and equality in majesty may be adored. In the Athanasian Creed, which the Church recites today, it says, the Godhead of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Over the centuries, the Catholic Church has jealously defended ever more and ever more clearly defined the doctrine of the Blessed Trinity. No sooner had the Catholic Church emerged from the nearly 300 years of brutal persecution under the Roman Empire than it was struck by an attack from within. That is, the heresy of Arius, a certain heretical priest who became the patriarch of Constantinople, who said that the Son was not God. And it was struck by the heresy of Sabellius, who said that there was only one person in God who manifested himself 
now as a father, now as a son, and now as a sanctifier. The First Council of Nicaea in 325 condemned these heresies and defined that the Son is consubstantial with the Father. But the fires of heresy were only beginning. Many Catholics embraced the new doctrine of Arius, encouraged as he was by the Roman emperors and particularly Constantius. This terrible storm of false doctrine lasted for more than 50 years and Catholic bishops were exiled from their thrones and replaced by the emperor with Arian bishops. It was not until Theodosius became emperor in 379 AD that the Arian bishops set in place by these heretical Roman emperors were chased from the Episcopal thrones which they falsely occupied. But the devil's attack on doctrine did not end here. The heretic Macedonius promulgated his false doctrine that the Holy Ghost was not divine, but merely a creature. In a series of councils over the centuries, the church again and again explained in greater detail and defined the sacred mystery of the Most Holy Trinity. What we should learn from the church's vigilance and care in this matter is that dogma is important. Indeed, it is so important that we must give up our lives in order to remain faithful to it. That dogma, which is true doctrine concerning God, is the most important possession that we have. It is worth dying for, and in fact, many have died for the truths of the Catholic faith, not only of the Blessed Trinity, but of many other dogmas as well. The reason why dogma is so precious to us is that we cannot please God and cannot go to heaven unless we profess the truths which he has revealed to us. St. Paul said it is impossible to please God without faith. And faith is assent of the intellect to truths revealed by God and proposed as such by the Catholic Church, which has the authority from God to propose them. That is the faith. It is not some obscure hope in God or or feeling about God. The faith is an assent of your mind to those truths. If you do not assent to those truths, you are not part of the Catholic Church, you are not attached to God, you are going to hell, objectively. Our assent to dogma and our consequent condemnation of heresy is in obedience to the first commandment of God I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. For a God who is described by false dogma is a strange God. It is not the true God. The predominant heresy today, and it should really be called an apostasy, is the modernist notion of dogma. For them, dogma is not an objective truth revealed by God and proposed by the infallible teaching authority of the Catholic Church, to which all must adhere under pain of mortal sin and under pain of separation from the true church. It is not for them an irreformable truth which expresses the nature of God or what pertains to God For the modernist, dogma is an expression of an interior religious feeling. They say that God is present in every man, and this apart from grace and the indwelling of the Holy Ghost through through grace. It it is not a question of that. They say he is present in every man, regardless of the state of his soul, and reveals himself to each man and to each one in a different way. Consequently, although there is only one God, they say, there are many dogmas often contradicting one another 
because human beings experience God in differing ways, which vary not only according to geography and culture, but also according to historical time. Religions are organized according to this modernist system of thinking because many people find that they have similar expressions and experiences of God. Once organized, religions publish their dogmas, so to speak, that is their descriptions of the common experiences of God which their followers have. So therefore the pagan uh, religions of Africa and, and of the Far East, etc., are all ways in which God reveals himself to men. And the modernists might say some are better than others, but they all have value. According to the modernists, therefore, the church must change its dogmas as human beings evolve. The church should listen, they say, to the experiences of its faithful in order to learn how they are experiencing God and should change dogma according to the needs of the time. In other words, constantly taking the temperature of the faithful to find out what the teachings of the church should be now. As a result, the conclusion emerges that what may be true in one time is now no longer true. Certain dogmas, they say, were good for their time, but no longer viable. In effect, these dogmas are consigned to a museum, just like an antique car, something to admire in its time and in its context, but not suitable for use in the present day. The outcome of the modernist thought, therefore, is evolution of dogma and ecumenism. Evolution of dogma is what I just explained. Ecumenism is to say that all religions have value because they ultimately all come from God. This ecumenism is the direct result of the modernist doctrine since if all are inspired by the same God inside of them, then all religions have a certain value and should not be considered false religions, as the church traditionally called them. Both of these heresies, evolution of dogma and ecumenism, have been condemned by the church, and both of these are taught by the Vatican II religion. The Novus Ordo religion is a place of dogmatic chaos, in which anyone may think, say, or write anything, even the most blasphemous heresies, with impunity. The new religion is something like a political arena in which there is freedom of thought and freedom of speech for all, in which there are liberals and conservatives who alternately come to power but who each assent to the basic premise that the church is a dogmatic free-for-all. No one ever gets condemned. They call it unity in diversity. This dogmatic chaos is a certain sign that the new religion is not the true religion of Christ, since it lacks the essential characteristic of unity of faith which Christ intended for his church and which the church has always possessed and still does possess. It is Vatican II which gave rise to this dogmatic chaos by its approval of ecumenism and of religious liberty, thereby enshrining the dictates of human conscience over the dogmas of the Catholic Church. Such a doctrine is fatal to the Catholic faith and to the Catholic Church. And we are seeing before our eyes over the past 60 years of Vatican II, the Church crumbling 
And by that, I don't mean not only institutionally by poor vocations and the closing of many churches, et cetera, but far more importantly, crumbling in its belief. 80% of people who call themselves Catholic do not believe that our Lord Jesus Christ is present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Blessed Sacrament. They think it's a piece of bread. Yet they are Catholics. And Biden, for example, is in favor of abortion, yet professes to be Catholic. Has anyone said anything to him? He is a heretic. He ought to be drummed out. Because if you don't, you destroy unity of faith. But that is the situation. That is how the church has crumbled. Yes, you still have institutions functioning, but inside it is rotten. Filled with heretics, filled with the very denial of dogma itself, which is worse than any heresy that has ever assailed the church. Luther, yes, he had his heresies. Calvin had his heresies. Modernism attracts, uh, attacks the very notion of dogma so that there is nothing to believe. There is nothing to adhere to. It ruins everything. As St. Pius X said, it goes down to the root and destroys the church right down to the root. And that's what we have witnessed over the past 60 years. <clears throat> Vatican II realized the dream of all of the enemies of the church who for centuries were plotting the reformation of Catholicism from within, altering it in such a way that it would become a dogmaless Christianity, a dogmaless humanitarianism, an all-embracing big tent of religious thought. It is for this reason that we resist, even to death, this transformation of our holy religion and would not even consider becoming a part of it. It is for this reason that we reject the hierarchy which espouses and promotes this new religion. They're false shepherds who feed the lambs with poison. It is for this reason that we say that the only solution to the problem that the church is facing today is the annulling of Vatican II as a true council. That's the only thing that will work As a result of Vatican II, the supposed pope of this new religion can attack the Holy Trinity with impunity and with virtually no reaction from even the most conservative of his followers. In 2014, he said this. <clears throat> He said, and this is a quote, but God does not exist. Do not be shocked. So God does not exist. There is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are persons. They are not some vague idea in the clouds. This God spray does not exist. The three persons exist. So he has reduced the, the unity of the divine essence to God's spray in a blasphemous mocking of Catholic doctrine, not to say heresy. What person in his right mind could call this man even an ordinary Catholic, let alone the Pope of Rome? How can you say that and hold that and call yourself a Catholic. Do we need to say any more? Or the Pachamama, this pagan Mother Earth God, carried around St. Peter's Basilica 
an idol, which the Jews always called in the Old Testament an abomination. The idols were an abomination. And the offerings that were offered to the Pachamama were placed upon the high altar of St. Peter's as this wicked man supposedly said mass. There it was, this bowl of garbage on the high altar of St. Peter's. What an offense to God. An abomination on that sacred place where great popes and saints offered mass. The holy sacrifice of the mass, defiled by idolatry. How could he even be an ordinary Catholic? <clears throat> and while it is a heinous crime before God and men to pronounce this heresy, what is yet more lamented, more to be lamented, is that Vatican II has done so much damage to the minds of Catholics that these statements engendered no horror or outrage even among those who consider themselves the most conservative and orthodox. They blithely accepted them, perhaps with a rolling eye or, or hands that were, were ringing as they heard these things, but they are in the same condition if they recognize the Novus Ordo as the, as Catholicism, if they recognize that man as Pope, they have to say, this is the Catholic faith. They may say we don't agree with these things or we think they're too far, but they, they must identify it with the Catholic faith. If they are in it, they are in communion with it, they are one with it, it is the same religion, the same church. That's the conclusion. So, although there are quite a few Catholics in the Novus Ordo who still retain the faith and who are outraged by these things interiorly, all of their strength is, is dissipated because th they still regard the Novus Ordo as Catholicism. It is not. It is a new religion which has been imposed upon the institutions of the Catholic Church by people who through subterfuge and deceit managed to get into the positions of authority in the Catholic Church. So they blithely accepted these things as one more heresy pronounced in the great house of heresy which Vatican II produced. What we witness, in other words, is the death of dogmatic orthodoxy. What is the soul of Catholicism, the uncompromising adherence to dogma as unchanging and unchangeable, an adherence to supernatural faith, of su an adherence of supernatural faith so firm that it has sent the, over the centuries millions of Catholics to the most violent deaths. That soul of Catholicism, which makes the Catholic Church everything that it is, is now dead in most of those who call themselves Catholics. Dead. Even the Society of St. Pius X, the organization founded by Archbishop Lefebvre to preserve Catholics from the errors of modernism, seeks a place in this dogmaless Christianity, claiming only the right to interpret Vatican II in their own way. And they place a portrait of the Trinity denying and Pachamama adoring Bergoglio heretic in their churches. When you walk in, you see a picture, a beautiful picture, big picture of the Trinity denying and Pachamama loving Bergoglio. as an introduction. But far worse, they place his unholy name in the holy canon of the Mass 
thereby offering their masses in union with a heretical heresiarch and a, someone who claims to be the head of the Catholic Church. We recently saw the devastating effect, uh, effect uh, upon a Vatican II upon a place that was once called the Island of the Saints, and that is Ireland. When I was in Rome in 2018, a lady came up to me on the street and said, please pray for Ireland. And we, she said, we're going to have a vote about abortion in a few days. And we had a long conversation about that. Ireland. And it, she told me at the end of the conversation, you know, I'm Protestant. And I was shocked. And we're talking about Republic of Ireland, which is probably 90% Catholic. That a Protestant is telling me to pray for the Catholics that they not vote for killing babies in Ireland. What a shameful thing. I was embarrassed. Shame. This place, Ireland, which for so many centuries endured the, the, the persecution of the British Catholics, excuse me, the British Protestants. Cromwell, for example, used to take all of the Catholics in the village, put them in the church, and then set the church on fire. The doors locked. They endured for centuries persecution and oppression for their faith, and now it has become a center of abortion. It also has permitted sodomitic marriage, utterly contrary to sacred scripture and to the teaching of the church. And all of that defection, which is a mere microcosm of the defection throughout the entire world of Catholics to heresy, is, must be placed at the feet of Vatican II. There is no other cause. <clears throat> it is as if we are sitting among the ruins of a, a great ancient city where centuries-old columns, once venerable in their beauty and majesty, now collapse one after the other. And virtually no one cares that the great edifice is turning to rubble. And this, I think, is because people still see the structure and are only interested in the structure. Well, there is total discontinuity of Catholic faith and practice and discipline and liturgy as a result of Vatican II. The structure, that is, the juridical government of the church, went sailing on without any significant change. And so they see this, the church is functioning like a machine, like a car, it's functioning. And based on that, they take whatever comes down and little by little, these attacks like being killed by a thousand small cuts has taken away from their minds the Catholic faith. When the Jews lost their faith in the Old Testament, after having been warned by many prophets, they were finally warned by Jeremiah, and this was on the eve of the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, where he totally wrecked the whole city, burned the Temple of Solomon, magnificent place, took out the, the desecrated the altars, everything, stripped the temple of all of its gold, everything beautiful in it, and brought it back to Babylon, including the Jews themselves, and enslaved them. And in anticipation of that, Jeremiah was telling the Jews, you better do something about your lack of faith. In other words, you must turn, turn again back to God, return to your true faith. And he warned them not to trust in the temple the temple was the temple of Solomon at the time, something like our St. Peter's Basilica, 
not only a great building, but a symbol of the strength of, of being the chosen people and of being favored by God. And they thought, this will never disappear. We have this. We are the chosen people. And he said to them these words. <clears throat> <clears throat> he said, Trust not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, it is the temple of the Lord. In other words, don't look at St. Peter's Basilica and say, It is the temple of the Lord, for in it there is nothing but heresy and corruption. The structures of the church, the government of the church, everything that is external in the church is made for the doctrine. It is made for what we call the spiritual side of the church, the faith, grace, the, the assistance of God to his church. All of those things are made for that, just as a sacred and beautiful chalice is made for the precious blood the precious blood is not made for the chalice. Indeed, if there were no precious blood, the chalice would become meaningless and just a show, just a museum piece. And that's what happens with Novus Ordo conservatives who try to preserve the faith merely by preserving the mass that you see here. If there is not the doctrine that these sacred and beautiful things clothe, if these things do not represent the sacred doctrine, then it is just dressing up. It's like Broadway. It's play acting. Because all of, this, all of these beautiful things are there and are beautiful because the doctrine is beautiful and true and everlasting. They send a message out, but if there's nothing underneath, it is just cardboard, it's skin deep and it will have no lasting effect. Vatican II's greatest victory over Catholicism is precisely this insensitivity to dogmatic orthodoxy and conversely its insensitivity to heresy. If you're insensitive to dogma, you're insensitive to heresy. For it is not for it not only gives a free pass to heresy and apostasy, which is rampant, but also from those who adhere to, from those who still adhere to Catholic dogmas, as many Novosordites do, and even from those who are resisting modernism, as some are, it drains all of their firmness, their strength, their holy intransigence, and their solemn sense of dogmatic orthodoxy because they must consent to the Novus Ordo as Catholicism, at least implicitly. And this dogmatic orthodoxy is the soul, as I said, of Catholicism, and its necessary consequence is martyrdom. Catholic truth demands death, and many have given themselves up to death in order to preserve it in their hearts and in their minds. <clears throat> so we today, a tiny number though we are, believe and profess all that the Roman Catholic Church teaches concerning this central mystery of our faith, this unchanging and holy faith, and we adhere to all the dogmas of the Catholic Church we hold them to be absolutely and objectively true for all peoples and all times and irreformable. We condemn as heretics those who reject any of the Catholic dogmas and teach to us the condemned doctrines of ecumenism and evolution of dogma. This steadfastness in unchanging dogma we have by the grace of God infusing in us the holy virtue of faith 
so much so that we would sooner be tortured to death before altering a single iota of it. St. Paul said, for there must be also heresies that they also who are approved may be made manifest among you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen. I want to thank all of you for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please do. Take care and God bless. And don't forget to click that bell for notifications of updates. See you later. Oh, and a thumbs up would be pretty nice too if you feel like you liked it. Come on.